Okay, this is section 4.4 IP, the Internet Protocol. This is kind of the mother protocol for the Internet, since it does have the same name. Right? This is the network protocol that allows networks to be networked together, the Internet Protocol. Um, and we're going to look at it in these four sections. First, at the format of the datagram. Um, talk about addressing, talk about ICMP, which is a helper protocol, um, and then look at sort of the future, although the future is now IPv6. All right, here's sort of a visual overview of where we've been, where we are, where we're going. Um, we've seen the transport layer, in TCP and UDP. Running on, we know they're running on top of the network layer, and that's what we're looking into now, this yellow part. Uh, we know that the network layer is sitting on top of a link layer, which is something like Ethernet or Wi-Fi. Um, which is on top of a physical layer, which is copper or fiber or wireless, those physical layers. So as we look into the network layer, notice these three components. Okay, so the network layer actually is more than just IP. IP is a big part of it. IP handles addressing the format of the datagram um, and some packet handling conventions, how fragmentation occurs. But IP has some helpers. Um, another really big helper is the, are the routing protocols. Routing protocols like RIP, OSPF, BGP. Um, the, we, we're going to talk about these in section 4.5 uh, and 4.6. The idea of these are, or the point of routing protocols is they figure out the global routes. How do you get from this kind of endpoint to this endpoint, from one host to another host over multiple hops, what's the best way to get there? the best route. Based on that routing protocol, they will help create the forwarding table that's used inside each router to make those local decisions. Make sense? Um, ICMP is kind of a, a uh, what would we call it, sort of a little minion of IP, I suppose, where it's another little protocol that sits right on top of IP um, and does sort of error reporting it allows routers to talk to each other when they need to send some signals to each other. Um, but it's not really at the transport layer. It really is kind of just a helper protocol for IP. All right, let's jump into this first section, the datagram format for IP. This is what IP looks like. If we look at this as a 32-bit chunk, so we're 32 bits wide, um, these are how all of the fields are laid out and delineated. So um, th this is what the designers of IP came up with. They define and they say, okay, the first four bits represent the version. Um, the next four bits are the length of the header. The next what, eight bits, the type of service. These 16 bits are the length, and so on and so forth for all these things. I put in bold the fields that are most important for us. There are several things that um, aren't as important and maybe aren't even used that much anymore. But they were defined in the protocol originally and you can't take them out right once they're there because all routers expect this format. Um, notice the things that are in bold and try to make these make sense to you because this really is important as to how IP works. The length, right? This is the length of the datagram in bytes. This is the total datagram. That means it includes the header and the actual payload, the data, which could be a variable length. Um, actually, with IP, the header can be a variable length as well because you can add options on, which is pretty uncommon, but it is possible to have a header that has more options that um, specify other things. So that's why it's, we need this length. Um, there is a 16-bit identifier, which um, and these flags and a fragment offset, all three of these are used for fragmentation and reassembly of packets, which we're going to talk about later. Um, there is a time to live field, TTL. So that kind of, it's a number which decrements on each hop. And once it gets zero, then it's dropped. And that's in there to make sure that packets don't get stuck in an infinite loop, where if there's a routing loop, um, it'll, the packets will eventually be stopped. Um, let me, uh, let me go ahead and just go to this next one. I know this is a lot of text, but uh, these labels kind of explain what these things are. Um, oh, I did miss this one, header length. So we do need to know the length of the header in bytes. Typically, it's going to be 20. 
Um, that's the no options length. But it could be longer if there are options. So you said that length is a header length plus the data length. Yes. In bytes. In bytes. Um, what else we have? Upper layer. This is really, really important. This is a number, a code, you could think of it, that defines what upper layer protocol to deliver the payload to. So the two most common protocols, transport protocols that work with IP are what? What two transport layer protocols have we talked about the most? TCP. Right, TCP and UDP, and they both have a code like, I don't know, 6 and 20. I'm kind of making that up. Um, not that important to me in this class, but there are these codes, right? And so it, this is really the glue that connects IP with the transport layer above it. So that code says this is the kind of data that I have in my payload, and therefore that this is the kind of service that I need to hand this to. Um, this is analogous to something we've seen at the transport layer. What's in the transport layer that's kind of the glue between the transport layer and the application layer? That's a number. Think about a number that's, rep that's present in both TCP and UDP that defines the type of data that's in there and what application is going to get that data. Port number. Exactly. So this, you see how they're really, it's the same idea, it's just called something different. And we'll actually see this in every layer as we go down, um, also in the link layer. We have this code of what kind of data is in here so I know who to give it to, who to pass it up to in our stack. Right. So port number says this is the application to give this segment to. Um, this upper layer is this is the the transport layer service to give it up to. Um, this is a header checksum. It's that same IP or it's that same internet checksum algorithm that y'all did in the last chapter. You know all those adding the ones complement all that. Um, and this just checks the header. All right. The last two things here are kind of the most important. You might argue the source and destination IP address. So this is a 32-bit number that uniquely specifies a host. That's what we're going to say for now. We'll tweak that definition later. But so 32 bits. So that means um, how many different hosts can we define with 32 bits? Are you asking? Yeah, I'm asking. We did it on the board last time. That, uh... Yeah. 2 to the 32, which is like 4 billion, right? Yeah. Um, notice this, that IP always has at least 20 bytes of data, if there aren't any options, and usually there aren't. So we've always got 20 bytes of overhead associated with IP. TCP also requires 20 bytes of overhead. So that means altogether we're going to have 40 bytes of overhead plus any application layer overhead. Um, so that's the extra data. We have to at least transmit 40 extra bytes for every datagram. Um, let's talk for just a moment about fragmentation and reassembly. This is sort of a pain, um, but I do want to impress upon you how much of a pain it is. Okay, so the link layer has this property called the maximum transfer unit. Basically, it's the maximum size of a link level frame. For Ethernet, that size is 1,500 bytes. So it can't send more than 1,500 bytes in a packet. Does that make sense? So what IP is going to do is, if it, what is IP going to do? If it gets a 5,000 byte packet, byte datagram, that needs to be sent on that link layer. That is physically impossible for to make a frame that's that big. Yeah. So what IP is going to do is break that 5,000 byte datagram into three. Uh, no, four, it'll have to be four datagrams for all those that, that are 1,500 bytes or less. And that process is called fragmentation. IP has an algorithm built in to do that. Um, to take one large datagram, make it three small datagrams, and then the final host is going to have to reassemble those. 
right, to identify all the fragments and put them in the right order to reassemble the large datagram. Um, the IP header bits are used to identify and order these related fragments. Those were these right here, the flags and the 16-bit identifier and the fragment offset. So those three fields are, we're going to use to do that. Let's see how we do it in this next one. All right, so in this example, imagine we have a 4,000-byte datagram, but our MTU is 1,500 bytes. Right, so it's sort of like we were having to jam this big, what, this big box through a small hole. Right, so we're going to have to break it up into smaller boxes. So, right, not a great analogy, but let's just roll with it. Okay, so in the original datagram, the length field is 4,000. The ID is some number. Let's call it X. Um, the fragment flag is zero, and the offset is zero. All right, so this fragment flag, we're going to mark it one if the packet has been fragmented. Um, the offset is going to represent how far, where this particular fragment is in the whole datagram. So, okay. so it's going to kind of define where it fits in the holes. Yes? So when does it get marked one for the fragment flag? Okay, when it's determined that so when the, the sending host determines that the size of the datagram is larger than the MTU, then it's going to have to break it up. So this would be at the, at the network layer. So what it's going to do when it sees this situation, 4,000 byte datagram, 1,500 byte MTU, um, is it's going to have to break it up into three datagrams. But notice if we do this, right, we're going to have to, um, we're going to have, to have headers for each of these, right? Because every datagram has to have a header. And we already said that header is 20 bytes. So that's why we have this 1480 bytes of actual data in addition to the 20 byte header. All right, so if we're gonna do that, we're gonna put the first 1500 bytes here. That's why the length is 1500. The ID is the same as it was up here, which is gonna be some 16 bit number. We're just calling it X so that it's easier to see. The frag flag now is one, because we're saying this is not a whole datagram, but this is a piece of one. This is a fragment. And the offset says, okay, this is starting at byte zero of that large datagram. Make sense? Now, now here's the tricky part. This offset is in eight byte units. All right, so... Offset 0 is byte 0. Offset 1 is byte 8. So that's why down here, even though we're starting right at byte 1501, because we put the first 1500 in here, um, it ends up being, well, it's not 1501 because we only got 1480 in it. So 1480 divided by 8 is 185. And so that 185 goes there to define what 8-byte chunk we're on. Um, the last fragment has a frag flag equal to zero to say this is the last one. And this is its offset. Again, that's another, um, well, it's the, the remainder of it, right? This 1040, 1040 was left after um, 1480 plus 1480 plus 1040 is our original 4,000. 1040 divided by eight must be that. Not 1040, but 1040 plus the, uh, the, the 1480. All right, so that's how IP fragmentation reassembly works. It's kind of a bear, and we would rather not do it. But because we don't know what the link layer MTU is, IP supports this so that it can definitely get the data across any link layer. Um, questions on this? fragmentation and reassembly.